Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Focal Point, the show that provides you with education and information for your health benefits. This is your host, Lourdes. We are broadcasting from Glendale, California via the Filipino Central TV. Today's show will feature skeletal or bone problems and treatment. While many of people associate orthopedics with the treatment of bones, it is a medical specialty that is much more complex. An orthopedist specializes in injuries and diseases of the musculoskeletal system and related tissues, including the spine, joints, ligaments, tendons, and nerves. Yours truly with the Filipino Central TV had the privilege to interview Dr. Raj Sinha at his prestigious clinic in Palm Springs, California, the Star Ortho. Specialists at Star Orthopedics who offer quality care that incorporates compassion with the latest in technological procedures headed by Dr. Sinha. Dr. Raj Sinha is an expert with cutting-edge surgery and research in the areas of bone metal interaction bone regeneration and robotic surgery. He was the first in the Coachella Valley and one of the first surgeons in the world to perform macoplasty, a robotic arm assisted partial knee replacement procedure. He has helped to design hip and knee replacement components including one of the most popular hip replacement stems in the world. His research has been published in leading journals and he has received multiple awards including a clinician scientist grant from the National Institutes of Health and many more. Most recently, Dr. Sin has served as director of the orthopedic curriculum of the Internal Medicine Residency at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He was co-director of the Ferguson Laboratory and an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery within the Division of Adult Reconstruction reconstructive surgery at UPMC. He remains active in surgeon education, lecturing worldwide, and organizing surgeon education conferences. Dr. Sinha is affiliate of the Board of the Diplomate of Orthopedic Surgery among other affiliation. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Raj Sinha. Hi, I'm Dr. Raj Sinha, President of Star Orthopedics. Star Orthopedics is located in the desert in the Palm Springs area. We have offices in Rancho Mirage and La Quinta. Primarily, we specialize in hip replacement, knee replacement, and sports medicine. But what's really been exciting in the last decade or so is the evolution of non-surgical treatments. Historically, we've used things like cortisone injections and even some lubricants to treat arthritis. But new biological treatments keep coming out and they're becoming more and more validated. So you've probably heard of athletes like Kobe Bryant and Peter Jacobson and other golfers like that going out and going to Europe to get stem cell treatment or PRP treatments. Well, those are now available in the United States and they're available at Star Orthopedics. Let me differentiate what the two of those things are from normal treatments. If you look at something like a cortisone injection, that has no healing potential. All that does is it blocks the pain fibers and then you don't feel pain. And by not feeling pain, that allows you to be active, and that's very important for muscle, uh, to maintain your muscle strength and your overall functionality. Similarly, whenever we talk about using things like uh, viscosupplementation or lubricants, what that is, is basically a methodology to try to decrease the friction inside the joint. You may have heard of it as chicken or rooster comb. That's actually where it started. It was purified rooster comb. It's the same molecule that we have in our joint fluid. And so when we inject that purified rooster comb in, it coats the surface of the bone and cartilage that are damaged, and that decreases the friction and therefore decreases the pain. But as you can imagine, some people react to the preservatives or, to, or they themselves are allergic to eggs and chicken, so they can't get that. So then synthetic versions came out. Some of those are Euflexa, Orthovisc, and things like that. All of the research on those basically show a couple things. They do not rebuild cartilage. You may see claims about that, but those drugs do not rebuild cartilage. They're believed to work by upregulating inside your knee the production of a, of a molecule called lubricin, which decreases the friction. So that helps, they do help, but all the research studies also show that it doesn't prevent the need for surgery, it just delays the need for surgery. And when I'm talking about surgery, I mean knee replacement. 
In the last decade or so, there's been a lot of research done on other biological things. The first thing that became popular was PRP. That stands for platelet-rich plasma. That stands for platelet-rich plasma. What that means is that we take your own blood, and from that blood, we isolate the platelets. The platelets are cells that normally function in clotting your blood and helping scars to heal. But they also have a lot of growth factors. And those growth decrease inflammation as well as stimulate tissues to heal and regenerate. It's important to think about how things heal. Most tissues heal through a scarring process. So for example, if you look at your skin, you cut your skin, somebody stitches it up, even if they do a really good job, you have a small scar that forms there. And that tissue in the scar is different than the tissue in your skin on either side of the scar. Bone and cartilage has the potential to heal without scarring, actually having new tissue form in those areas. Bone is the classic example. But the good news about bone is that it heals pretty rapidly, very consistently most of the time. Cartilage, on the other hand, does not. And so what we're hoping to accomplish with the PRP is to get the cells in the cartilage to stimulate formation of more cartilage and thereby heal the normal tissues and not have a scar. So this is actually the potential to increase the normal tissue. Um, the, again, the early research shows that if you look at just head-to-head -head protocols, one comparison versus another, it's hard to say that PRP is, is, is better than just cortisone or lubricant shots. However, you have to look at the individual patient. And if you, take the, if you take the ability to be able to adjust and modify the treatment protocols, that's when you get the real effectiveness of PRP, and that's where you see it. Rarely is one treatment enough, but sometimes two or three is what you need to get everything done. Other, other than arthritis, PRP is very useful for chronic conditions like tendonitis and bursitis. These are situations where the uh, tendonitis, for example, is a situation where you have these partial tears in the tendon and they don't heal through typical treatments like physical therapy, cortisone shots, and anti-inflammatory medications. When we inject the PRP into those areas where the tendon is chronically torn, that old scar, bad tissue, actually gets converted over into new tissue because cells are stimulated to move into that area and, and remove the bad tissue and replace it with normal tissue. Common places where we see tendonitis is the shoulder, the knees, and the hips. Bursitis is a similar condition to tendonitis. You don't actually have the muscle or the tendon involved. Instead, you have these little bursa sacs that sit between tendons. And their normal function is to provide a lubricated surface so that two tendons that slide relative to one another don't have friction and can slide easily. But if those tendons get out of balance, either from injury or muscle weakness, then the bursa sac gets inflamed. Frequently, even after you correct the underlying problem, namely the muscle weakness, the bursitis and the inflammation from the bursitis remains. And again, we treat those with typical traditional things like cortisone, anti-inflammatory medication. But those only work about 60 to 70% of the time. Sometimes we add physical therapy and other treatments like iontophoresis or phonophoresis, ultrasound, laser, things like that. And that adds, that cures another 10 to 15%. So that leaves us about 15 to 20 percent of cases that aren't going to get better, and that's where we look at PRP uh, to try to help get those patients resolved, get them out of pain, get them fully rehabilitated and back into a high level of function. So PRP is sort of the first biological step. The next biological step is stem cells. Stem cells come in all varieties, and not one stem cell preparation is necessarily the same as another stem cell preparation. One example of a stem cell preparation, and probably the one that's most common in California, because it's a little more regulated in California, is to take fat, like out of your belly, and then isolate out a certain fraction of cells. These are actually called stromovascular cells. They're not exactly stem cells, but they have some stem cell-like properties. And then you can take that stromovascular fraction of cells, concentrate it into the right number of cells, and then inject it for all the same conditions I just talked about arthritis, bursitis, and tendonitis. Another way to get stem cells is actually to go into the bone marrow and get the stem cells from there. Now that's not commonly done in California or even in this country very frequently. But for example, when we do big bone surgeries and we have areas of bone that aren't healing, because we have access to the bone, we can take that tissue right out the bone marrow and put it back into the area of bone that isn't healing. The last sort of way that stem cells are starting to become introduced is through this uh, fraction of amniotic tissues. 
So these are these are actually tissues taken from live births. They're taken from the lining of the placenta and the uterine, called the chorion. And the cells that are there, as well as the tissue that's there, is rich in growth factors. But really importantly, the cells themselves don't have any immunological competence. That means you can use those cells on anybody, and that person's immune system will not reject those cells. So those cells, because they're fetal cells, they're brand new, uh, they have the potential to do a lot of things. Typically, cells have the ability to go through about 70 to 75 divisions of the cells. That means they can grow and regrow 75 times. And that takes you to about 50, 60 years of life. After that, cells are programmed to die and stop dividing. Well, these amniotic fluid cells, because they're, they're what we call totipotential stem cells, have the ability to grow and grow and grow forever. So when we put those in the right concentration in the right locations, they have the ability to, again, take your old degenerated tissue and revitalize it and convert it back into new healthy tissue. So as you can imagine, because a lot of these things are relatively uh, new, we, have, we need to see you, we need to evaluate you, get the right x-rays, possibly MRIs, decide if you need to have bracing, decide if you need to have other topical pain medication treatments. These are all adjunctive to the PRP and the stem cells. If you're deemed to be a stem cell candidate, then we'll arrange to have the stem cells available here so that we can administer to them, them to you directly in our offices. To get more information about all of these technologies, you can certainly visit our website at www.starortho.com or call the number at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes, unfortunately, despite all of these non-surgical treatments, we have to do surgery. What's really interesting about what we're doing is we're using the highest level of technology to make sure that the surgery is done properly. For example, on the knee, we're the only surgeons that are offering a customized knee replacement. That means that we do a CAT scan, we build a three-dimensional model of your knee, and then we build the device to exactly fit your knee and to recreate the shape and contour of your knee. Nobody else is doing that. What everybody else is doing is they're taking an off-the-shelf knee that comes in eight sizes and they try to pick the best size that fits for you. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't. And then if they don't fit well, then the surgeon is now stuck in between sizes and surgery and they have to make a compromise. So frequently, if the surgeon makes the wrong decision, what the patients wind up with is stiffness, pain, and they get the feeling that the knee just itself feels like it's too big and it won't allow their knee to bend properly. That's usually a situation where the surgeon was stuck between sizes and chose wrongly. With a customized knee replacement, that's never an issue. It fits perfectly every single time. And more importantly, it recreates the contour of your knee. Why is that important? It's important for the following reasons. What the early research has shown is that there's less bleeding, so therefore less risk of transfusion. There's less swelling, so there's less pain and a quicker recovery. You get your range of motion better. The implants themselves are put in most, more accurately than any other implants that are available on the market. And because we're recreating the normal contour of your knee, the way the knee moves, or the biomechanics of the knee, is the closest to a normal knee as any implant that's out there or available right now. What we're hoping to see in the future is that by having a knee that feels more normal to you, you'll be able to do more things than you would with the traditional knee replacement. And the last thing that I think is really critical about the customized knee replacement is because it's customized, we actually take away less bone and tissue. Generally speaking, the more of your own body you can keep, the better off you're going to be. So once again, for more information about all those technologies, visit our website at www.starortho.com. Call the number there at the bottom of your screen. Did you know that the first knee replacement was performed in 1968? And did you know that there are more than 120,000 hip replacement surgeries performed each year in the U.S.? And also, did you know that over 3 million sports injuries occur in children and teens each year? From a knee replacement to a torn rotator cuff, the highly trained surgical team at Star Orthopedics offers the most innovative technology and techniques available to expertly diagnose and treat your complex pain or injury. In addition, they design recovery and rehabilitation programs that will enable you to use the afflicted area to its fullest capacity. And that is our informative show with Dr. Sinha. Now, friends, 
We had some offline phone calls from our show last week. And our caller by the name of Eliza is due to have her baby in two weeks and she would like to know about cord blood banking. So here is her question. What is cord blood banking and is it better to use a public or private facility? Eliza, here is your answer. Cord blood banking is a procedure in which cord blood, a rich source of stem cells, is taken from a newborn's umbilical cord after delivery and used for research or preserved for possible use in a stem cell transplant. Collecting a baby's cord blood proposes few, if any, risk to mother and baby. If a baby's cord blood is not collected for preservation or research, it is discarded. If you are considering cord blood banking, Consider the differences between using a public and private facility. For public cord bank blood banking facility, you might choose this option if you'd like your baby's cord blood to be available for research or public use. Cord blood from unrelated donors can be used to treat conditions such as leukemia. Cord blood can be collected at any facility where healthcare providers are trained to recover cord blood and you will not be charged. The donation is then shipped to a cord blood bank. Cord blood banked in a public program will not likely be available for future private use. Private cord blood banking facility? You might choose this option if you want to preserve your baby's cord blood for possible personal use. The cost can be considerable, including a collection fee and ongoing maintenance fees. Yet the chance that your child will ever use the banked cord blood is very remote. Also, should your child need a stem cell transplant, there is no guarantee that the banked cord blood will remain viable or be suitable for a transplant. So if you would like to know more about public cord blood banking or wonder whether private cord blood banking would be a worthwhile investment, consult your healthcare provider. He or she can help you make an informed decision. Thank you for watching, friends, and tune in again next time for a more informative show here on the Filipino Central TV. And we would like to express our thanks to our sponsors, especially South Main Rejuvenation Institute, Dr. Apollinar Johnson, and Loella Aishin for your all skin care and body sculpting care, and to all the staff of Sweet Grace Home Health Services, for providing good nursing and rehabilitation care to their homebound clients. Until next time friends, stay safe and healthy. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. And together, we can build a strong Filipino Central.